Hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, today we're going to pick up right where we left off in our sermon series in the Gospel of John. So if you want to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 1, we're going to go through verse 35 to 51. And while you're turning to John chapter 1 verse 35, let me kind of review where it is we left off last time. So we saw John the Baptist and we got to know his ministry a little bit. And how that guy's just always pointing people to Jesus. Didn't matter what the cost, that guy's pointing people to Jesus. And there came a point where he goes to baptize Jesus. And Jesus at that moment of baptism is revealed to be one of the triune Godhead. And so a very significant moment. We started to reflect a little bit about baptism and what baptism means and what it is, what it isn't. Well, that's where we left off. Now, starting in John chapter 1, verse 35. It says, the next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they, they followed Jesus. And turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? And they said, Rabbi, which means teacher. They said, Where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. And so they went and saw where he was staying. And they, they spent the day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was, was one of the two who heard that John had said and had followed Jesus. And the first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And, and he brought him to Jesus. Look, Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. The next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. And when Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. And Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. And Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You'll see greater things than that. Then he added, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Okay, so here we have Jesus selecting his leaders. Jesus is, is choosing the men who would be the steward of his church planting and his mission movements and, and furthering his kingdom after his ascension into heaven. Now these guys, they're not aware of it yet, but they would be called to give their very lives and to spend the rest of their life in service to the God. They'll be incredibly blessed as a result of this call. They'll get to see miracles and wonders, the likes of which you and I only get to read about. Now, many have said that they wish they could see what the 12 apostles have seen. But when they say this, do they, do they realize the cost which these men had to pay to see these wonders? You know, because these guys, they gave it all. There wasn't a plate being passed around. They could collect a big old tithe. They didn't have big marble statues made out of them. They were called to give their lives. They were often persecuted until the point of death. So, let's look at the text. We see that John the Baptist was hanging out with some of his own disciples. Now, let's pause there. When we hear the word disciple, we often think about the followers of Jesus and, and, the, and that we want to be a disciple. Because that's the context which we use the word the most today. We want to be a disciple of Jesus. But back in Jesus' day, you know, the, the word disciple, any teacher would have had a disciple. Now, Jewish, Roman, whatever, didn't matter. Any teacher would have students, and the most dedicated of those students would be disciples. So in the Jewish vernacular, the teacher would be called rabbi, and the students were called disciples. Now, now we've come to kind of define disciple a little differently now. But for the sake of being true to the text, I'm going to use the word student, because in the original language, the word, decipher, <laughs> the word disciple can literally be translated pupil or learner. And usually when I say disciple, like like when I'm saying, we're trying to make some disciples around here. I'm saying that we want to make little Jesuses who want to 
make little Jesuses. We want to make people who look just like Jesus. So, so we see here in verse 35 that some of John the Baptist's students were, were hanging out with John when Jesus goes walking by. And John gets all excited. He says, look, there's the Lamb of God. Now there goes John again. You know, every opportunity this guy gets, he's pointing people to Jesus. He's pointing people past himself and to the Christ. And so the students of John's, they go with Jesus to be Jesus' students instead. Does John get all jealous or upset? No, no. It's John's whole point in life. Its whole purpose in life is to point people to Jesus. And John knew that to move people past himself and onto Jesus was the best thing he could do for the people. Any Christian, especially your Christian leaders, would do well to acknowledge this themselves. Because if you get stuck on me and my teachings, you're, you're going to find us coming up short and disappointed, regular. If you can see past me into the teachings of Jesus Christ, well, those are the teachings I'm just passing along. They're his teachings. And if you can see past me to those, then you stand a chance at really growing deeper, maybe even deeper than I've grown. And if you get stuck on me, well, I'm going to make mistakes and fail. And when I do, you will stumble. If you see past me to Jesus, then you'll, you won't be restricted by my limitations. You see, I can't always be here. I can't always be there. You know, I can't walk with you everywhere you go, but God can. And most importantly, when the more we get to know Jesus, the more our appreciation for him is going to grow. The more time we spend getting to know Christ, the more our understanding of who he is and what he wants to do for us gets better. And we may be drawn to him by his teachings, but when we come to really know him, We'll know him as the Son of God and our Savior. You know, those aren't just catchphrases. These words, they take on a whole new meaning when we step from one side of the faith to the other. Before relationship, they, they really are just words. Now, we might be able to give the Webster's Dictionary definition of them, but when we know Christ personally, these words and their definitions, they become poetic. That's why the students of John's were willing to leave John and follow Jesus at a moment's notice. Uh, they didn't do anything that John didn't want them to do. They did what exactly what John wanted them to do. So now we see Jesus selecting his leaders, these 12 apostles. And we see how Jesus, he selected these first ones. Notice the conversation. You know, we, we, they see Jesus and they start following him. Jesus turns around and says, like, what do you guys want? And they asked to go with him. Wherever you want go, we want to go. Where you're staying, we want to stay. And so they spent the afternoon together with Jesus. They got together. They got to know him. They wanted to kind of see if this was for real. Now, Jesus didn't put these men into his entourage by accident or, or because they were the first and closest willing participants. Well, as so it does tend to happen in a small church environment a lot today, we select and appoint leaders because we just need the first warm body willing to do the job. And it starts to look a lot less like calling and a little bit more like, desperation and then those people who weren't supposed to be pointed to a position of leadership in the first place fail and cause somebody to stumble and yeah that was not what jesus was doing these guys following jesus jesus had a supernatural understanding of how these events were going to take place so he he chooses these leaders and he presents himself to the to them in a way that he knows they need for them to respond you might think back to your testimony how your testimony might be a little different than most of the people you know everybody's got their own testimony god revealed himself to you exactly how you needed him to like later in this chapter we, when he chose nathaniel he, he revealed himself to nate by acknowledging something that happened nobody but god could have known and it's funny how jesus selected his leaders you know in some cases he sought out specific people with a prior knowledge of who they were and what they're going through in other cases, he just presented himself and said, and let them approach. But it's no coincidence that Andrew and this unnamed disciple, who was probably John the Revelator, they were among the chosen because Andrew was Peter's brother and God had big plans for Peter. We know a lot about how Christ selected the various apostles from other places in the gospel. We can put the whole story together when we look at all of what the Bible has to say. For example, with Peter, we know that when Jesus went to recruit Peter, Peter was, was busy. He was too busy with work. He was too distracted with his busyness to recognize that Messiah was calling him. 
But Andrew was so excited about finding out, finding God, that, that he couldn't wait to tell his brother and anybody who would listen. You might, you might be able to relate to that. You remember that new believer fire? I, I pray it never burns out. But, but for the saved, there was probably a time where you could not help but to scream it from the rooftops. You tell anybody who would listen, maybe a few people who won't. And that's where we find Andrew. So, so Andrew, he takes Jesus to Peter. And we know how that went from, from other places in the scripture. See, Peter, he's busy at work. He's on a boat as a fisherman. And Jesus gets Peter's attention, but Peter's a bit reluctant. Ah, I'm busy. Well, Peter's having a hard day at work. He spent all night casting his net, and he's getting nothing nothing to catch. Comes back with nothing. And then until Jesus shows up. Jesus gives Peter some advice. It seems kind of silly to an experienced fisherman. He says, why don't you cast your net in on the other side? Peter's like, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's silly, but okay. Peter takes the advice, and, and as the result of his obedience, he got to see God work. The net came back so full it was, was heavy with fish. And God used this experience as a teaching moment. He called Peter to leave his work and follow Jesus for the rest of his life. He said, you see how hard you're working without me and how little you're getting? And you see how much more you get with me in your life, God says? He says, well, I want you to put down your fishing net. We're going to go fishing for souls. I want you to become a fisher of men. We're going to go spread the gospel message. And Peter did. And with that, Jesus continues to put a pretty ragtag group of guys together. For example, you know, Peter, he, he would later be called by Jesus the rock on which he would build his church. But Peter's faith and integrity could hardly be described as a solid rock, which is encouraging to me. It may be for you, too. You know, it's often I feel insufficient to answer God's call. Like John the Baptist felt unqualified to baptize Jesus, I often feel unqualified to, to be the steward of his word. I have to go to God every day with a prayer of repentance. Every day I'm disappointed with myself as a Christian. And it may be the same for you. And yet God has still called us and he still plans to use us, even if our faith needs a little bit of shaking to wake up. Like when Jesus called Nathan, this is kind of a funny story. It starts with Philip. All Jesus had to do with Philip was say, come on, follow me. Jesus, then Philip got up and was obedient. He moved. Boom. When Phil finds Nate along the way and he's all excited, and he's like, dude, I found God. This is the one that the prophets have been writing about for centuries. This is the one Moses wrote about way back in the day. Here he is. It's Jesus. And Nate says, yeah, right. He's from Nazareth. That town's messed up. There's no way God's Messiah is coming out of Nazareth. Nothing good comes out of Nazareth. When Phil drags Nate along anyway, and Jesus sees Nate, and he's like, hey, here's a guy you can trust. Nate's like, come on, dude, you don't even know me. And then Jesus blows his mind. Jesus says, yeah, we shared that moment under the fig tree that one time, you remember. Nobody knew what Jesus was talking about except for Nate. And clearly there had to be some real intimate moment between Nate and God under the fig tree that was emotional and significant and private. We don't know exactly what happened under the fig tree, but we can guess. Because when Jesus called it, Nate's jaw drops, and, and he says, Whoa, you are the Son of God. And it's a good thing that Nate did not let his stereotypes of Nazarenes ruin his perspective so much that he couldn't see God's plan. Because that's the truth for so many, isn't it? Because Nate was open to God entering his life, Nate had his mind blown. And his life began to change right then and there. We, we often have the, the same choice. It's here at the same place we have the same choice. Are we going to have a stereotype get in our way of how God should work or who God should work through? See, when God comes knocking on our hearts, it's going gonna, it's gonna to stir up some emotions. And God knows all about these intimate details and private affairs. Like Nathan, nothing is hidden from God. So when God shows up and he reveals himself to us, how will people respond? Well, there's the side of us that feels shame and, and wants to reject the presence of God so we don't have to feel the shame because we know we're not going to change. And then there's the other side of us that knows what really should be rejected, which is the sin in our life. And so we accept God in and push the unholiness out. But when being seen by God, we, we can't pretend to be something we're not. 
We may be able to put on a good show for the people in our lives, but God sees right through it. And we sort of already know that. And our reaction to this feeling says a lot about our spiritual maturity. And it's in this way that God starts to put his church together. He puts together his pretty mixed bag, irregular, and incompatible people. You know, for example, we've got Matthew the tax collector. Now, now, many would have looked at this choice and thought, okay, you know, if Matt can be saved, anybody can be saved. But here's why. You know, the tax collector, he was a tax collector. He, the job of the tax collector was to collect taxes from the, the, the Jewish citizens and give it to the Romans who were occupying Jerusalem and the various territories. So, so Jerusalem used to be governed by the Hebrews, and then the Romans came in and conquered it, and their army oppressed the Jews, and they imposed their Roman rule on Jerusalem. It became a Roman territory now, and Romans were the ones who governed it. And the Jews didn't like it. Oh, who would? They're being occupied by a foreign, foreign army. And the taxes was collected to pay for such an occupancy. So all the taxes that were paid by the Jews were affording the Romans to get rich off of them and to oppress them. So the Jews didn't like it. And furthermore, the Romans hired Jews to collect these taxes. So the Jews saw the tax collectors as to be the worst of the worst. Because their job was to to collect something they didn't want to give and give it to people they didn't like. Furthermore, the tax collectors were greedy. They, If they needed to collect five, they would collect 15 and keep the other 10, for example. They were getting rich. They were extorting. They were using this authority and taking more than they needed and got rich off it. And everybody knew it, and it was okay. It was one of the incentives for being a tax collector. You too could get rich. And so... You know, this guy was the last person the Jewish religious leaders would have picked themselves if they wanted to build God's church with. Now, in the same group as saved Matthew, changed Matthew, we have Simon the Zealot. Now, what's a zealot? He's the opposite of a tax collector. The, the zealot would be considered like a terrorist by our standards. He was, he was willing to oppose Roman occupancy by any means, including violence and murder. So they would do things that would cause major destruction, they would kill, and they were known well for it. And so the zealot would oppose the tax collectors more than anybody else. And they would probably want to make an example out of a tax collector, just to strike fear into the hearts of anybody who would support the Roman occupancy. A zealot was essentially a terrorist. So to have a tax collector and a zealot in the same group was definitely going to blow some minds. you got somebody who's supporting the Roman occupation and profiting from it. And the same group was a man who committed acts of terrorism to fight supporters of the Roman occupancy. And the only two things, the only thing these two people had in common was their love and devotion to Jesus as the Messiah. And you know what? That's a beautiful thing I'm grateful for. Because it's a similar situation in our church, isn't it? You know, there's something really special happening when people come together in the name of the Lord. Because we get to share a relationship that would not have been possible without the love of God. And it's these relationships that shape God's church. God puts together his church today the same as he did when he selected his apostles. We have a group of sinners, some of us a bit more screwy than others, and yet all of us able to be used without exception. You know, culturally, we may have some differences, but, but the love of God unites us and reminds us that, that we've got more in common than anything else, and our differences are what makes us complete as one big body of believers. We're just some average folks living average lives in average places, and that's exactly where God wants to build his church. Like when he revealed Jesus to be the Messiah and the Trinity worked in plain view at the shores of the Jordan River, God started this revelation to all who would watch right there in the common meeting space for people of all backgrounds, especially to those who are celebrating their need for a Savior. And it's the same way today. I mean, God's going to show up right where he needs to be. Wherever God's redemption is needed, God will be there. God will show up in our schools. He'll show up in our communities. He'll show up in our work. He'll show up in our home, wherever God's redemption is needed. God will be there. And his instrument in delivering his message is average, ordinary folks with no prestige, often 
no credentials. And take, for example, you know, the women who found Jesus' empty tomb. Consider the significance of this for a moment, because in this culture at this time, women were second-class citizens. Or not even. They were property. They were owned by their fathers until ownership was transferred to a husband, usually as the result of an exchange of like a dowry or maybe because there was a beneficial family alliance. But women had no right to give a testimony in court or and nor would their story of incredible happenings be considered valid by any man in that system. Now, it was at the point of crucifixion, many of the bystanders left. Those who remained were mostly women. People left, including John, who wrote this gospel. And in Luke, we read that as Jesus was being led to his death down the road, as he carried his own cross, there were a group of women following and wailing along the way. And it was these women who were the last holdouts as Jesus died on the cross while the sky turned black. The women that followed Jesus' body to the tomb and took part in the burial, even while Jesus' male followers were fleeing for their lives or wandering off, discouraged by the events, it was, it was the women who knew where to go to find Jesus' tomb after the Sabbath. And it was them who had the privilege of first discovering the evidence of the resurrection. And it was these same women who got the privilege of announcing it to the men who were sitting around all depressed at a table. The men who didn't believe it whenever they heard it. And the men Jesus had called and revealed so much to and had equipped with so much power were inspired by the women who had no place in society. While the men were sitting around and whining, the women were taking action and were so positioned to be the first responders for the most epic revelation. And Jesus was back from the dead, just as he said he would be, proving to anybody without any doubt, even among the most faithful apostles, that Jesus was, in fact, the Son of God. And, and, and it's in this way God continues to build his church with the unlikely. His favorite instrument for furthering his kingdom is the average, ordinary person or the disenfranchised. It's God's signature move. So, so let's think about this. Jesus calls us just as we are. Right where you are, in all your sin and all your imperfection, Jesus has called you to know him. And it's with this imperfect, sinful, unqualified life, Jesus wants to take it and make it into something bigger than we can even accomplish on our own. Right where you are, you're on mission. As Jesus changes our hearts to want what he wants, the people around us in our average ordinary lives are going to begin to notice. In your family, in your work, in your school, on your social media, in your neighborhood, all of the places where you engage with people, you're on the mission field. And because the mark of a saved sinner is transformation, people will start to notice God in you. They, they know who you used to be and what you used to be about. Now they're seeing who you're becoming and what you're about now. And so that that's a witness for Jesus. And so we now we've got to ask ourselves, are we a good witness or a bad witness? When we represent ourselves as Christians, people notice. They see us when we say we're believers, especially if our lives do not match up. And therefore, we're a bad witness because the non-believer will see no reason to worship our God. And when our, we live our lives in a way that's pleasing to God, that gets people's attention too. Not the cross necklace around our necks or the shirts or our words, but our actions, our lives. As with that attention, we want people, we want, we want to point people to Jesus and say, say, with him, literally anything is possible. If I could be saved, anybody could be saved. Let us not be discouraged by how far we fall short. The most mighty men of God fell very short. That does not discourage God. It only discourages us. Let's live our lives on mission anyway. Let's do this at any cost. Let's do this today. In every social situation, in the privacy of our homes, with our loved ones watching, let's show them what Jesus can do for them too, so that they want to know God themselves. And it's with this, this in spirit of reflection, let's pray. Lord, I just want to, I want other people to see you, and I'd love for them to be able to see you through me. I pray that you will be revealed. You will, there will be a beacon of light 
that will shine through me the way the moon reflects the sun in the night sky. Let you be reflected off of us in our dark communities. I pray that you will give us the conviction and show us the way to draw closer to you. And whenever we would choose sin, we pray that you'll forgive us. We thank you for your mercy. Where would we be without it, Lord? Thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, church. Thanks for joining us. See you again next week. Have a nice day.